I'm really pleased this morning to get the opportunity uh, to interview the U.S. Um, House of Representative Republican from Minnesota, Tom Emmer. Um, he introduced the Cuba Trade Act of 2015 along with Congresswoman um, Kathy Castor. And um, we had a conference call with the congressman about two months ago, I think, six weeks ago. I have no idea. Yeah. Sometime this year. <laughs> and to talk about Cuba. And in the last 10 minutes, I've had this amazing opportunity to not just talk about Cuba, but to talk about hemispheric relations. And I will say he is one of the most informed congressmen and interested congressmen um, that I've met on the Hill. I'm not sure what that's. Susan, they must have set the threshold really low. <laughs> Um, prior to, to joining Congress, um, he represents the 6th Congressional District in January of 2015. He was in the Minnesota House of Representatives from 2005 to 2011. Um, so I'm going to start right in um, and ask him some questions. So tell me, Congressman, how did you get interested in Cuba? What, what stimulated you? Well, actually, uh, it, it started with a conversation that took place right after the election uh, in uh, November of 2014. I, I sat down with one of our former uh, U.S. Senators in the state of Minnesota, a guy by the name of Rudy Boschwitz, who uh, Rudy was giving me a little bit of advice as I was uh, newly elected and getting ready to uh, head to Washington. One of the pieces of advice Rudy gave me was, you know what, Tom, you're going to have all kinds of things you can get involved in. There's an issue for everything, and they're all important to somebody. He said, but if you want to be productive, if you want to have uh, hopefully a good experience in Congress, find the one thing that's in your wheelhouse. And uh, when I, I got my committee assignments at the end of December before I headed off to be sworn in in January, I was initially assigned to the Agriculture Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. And when that happened, I knew exactly what the one thing was. Uh, Minnesota is still home to 18 Fortune 500 companies, and the two primary drivers of our private economy are manufacturing and agriculture. That one thing was trade. So I got to Congress, and for the first uh, several months, uh, it, the foreign policy thing also, you know, you, uh, you get involved uh, raising a family, running a business, you serve in a state legislature, you uh, probably won't be surprised. Foreign policy is not something that you're actively involved in every day, but it's something that I'd had an interest in my entire life. And so it was wonderful to get into Congress and have that almost 90-degree uh, uh, angle learning curve and just get deep into it. I worked on Trade Promotion Authority uh, initially, uh, studied it, learned it, understood what it was. I created a letter for the freshman Republican members. There are 47 of us. There are 10 Democrats in this 114th Congress that are serving our first term. I created a letter uh, to get my fellow Republicans to sign on to to support Trade Promotion Authority because as people in this room probably know, if you've been in Congress for a period of time, you have a, a voting record. People generally know where you stand in these issues, but if you're brand new, and you're coming out of a private sector uh, professional experience or you're coming out of a state legislature, you typically don't vote on trade issues, so people don't know where you're at. I thought it would be very helpful to get my colleagues to sign off on the letter because then leadership would know where they stood on trade issues and specifically on TPA. We got almost 30 of the members, uh, the freshman members, to sign off on it. Plus, it was about building relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, it elevated me within the conference uh, much quicker than I thought because, uh, unbeknownst to me, the number one issue in the first six months of Congress for a guy named Paul Ryan was getting Trade Promotion Authority passed. Uh, Paul Ryan actually invited me into his small uh, Republican whip group with Paul Ryan from Wisconsin, Pat Tiberi from Ohio, uh, Pete Sessions from Texas, and it was about you know building support for TPA. So with all that background, what happened was I started to, st I was assigned also initially to the uh, uh, Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. Uh, and this is where you and I started to talk about this. I, I believe, and this will get us to Cuba very quickly, sorry for the, the, the uh, I'm actually enjoying this. Thing. All right. I could ask you about TPP. 
you can ask me about any of it. Uh, anything's fair game. But what it did for me is it, it caused me to start looking at the globe. And it's interesting for me, I think, uh, and rightly so, we've spent a lot of time in this country, our leadership, concentrating on the Mideast and Asia. Uh, when in fact, we need to start paying a lot more attention to our own backyard, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and, and the more I looked at it, the most pressing issue today, and there are many, there are many across the Western Hemisphere, but for me, the most pressing issue is lifting the embargo in Cuba. I come from a state, I, I have told you the economic background, but our background with Cuba goes back more than a decade. When Congress made exceptions to the embargo back in the late 90s, I think it was 1999, somebody can correct me, but uh, exemptions were made to the embargo for agricultural products. Was it 2001? Thank you. Well, I know it's right in there. I'll tell you why I know without going back and looking. Because when those exemptions were created for medical supplies and agricultural products, uh, a former governor of the state of Minnesota, who happened to also be a former professional wrestler, <laughs> led the first uh, uh, trade mission uh, for the state of Minnesota down to Cuba. So Minnesota was one of the first states to start to build this relationship. And we've got uh, our agricultural industry and others who have been uh, heavily invested in seeing this relationship grow. Uh, for me, it, the, the thing that tipped it over was a trip to Havana in uh, late May, early June. Once you get down to Cuba and you actually have the uh, experience with the Cuban people, uh, it told me right then and there, you know, 54 years, 11 presidents, a policy that was originally created to destabilize the government to try and give the people back control of their own destiny. If it was ever to have worked, it should have worked back in the 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed. It didn't work. Uh, it hasn't worked, and I, I think it was Pope John Paul, I, I, somebody can correct me on this as well, but I think it was Pope John, I'm looking right at you, yes. Uh, Pope John Paul, I think, was the one who either said or wrote after a, uh, uh, after a visit, and I can't remember if it was Cuba, but it was embargoes generally harm the people they're intended to help the most. And if we truly believe that it's about helping the Cuban people, about helping them start to uh, evolve and grow and, and improve their opportunity for peace and prosperity in the future, it starts with lifting the embargo. So long-winded uh, background, but that's why in late July we introduced a, a bill, a straight bill, just to lift the embargo once and for all. So since you opened the door to lifting the embargo, um, what do you think the chances are that this happens um, before the end of the Obama administration? I think there's a lot of fear, as I was mentioning to you as I travel around Latin America, that this won't happen and therefore, you know, it would leave Cuba policy and what President Obama has done for some space to backtrack. I, I would not be, uh, let's say this, there is a chance to get this done before the, Obama, uh, before the end of the Obama administration. And I'm gonna be very strong uh, about my statement. You don't obviously have to agree with me, but uh, here's what it's gonna take. It's not just about what we have to do in the legislative process. It's about the people who are in this room. It's about all the businesses that say they're engaged across this country, but being engaged doesn't mean just joining a pro-Cuba uh, trade group. It doesn't mean just saying we're in favor of lifting the embargo. You must engage. If you will engage, which means if you start to uh, let your elected representatives know this is about jobs in this country, if you start talking directly to your elected officials and telling them that, you know what, Cuba is in the process of changing. If you want to help the Cuban people, then stop it with the excuses that this will only benefit the government. That's not what it's about. It's about benefiting the Cuban people. And you need to engage. You need to engage to help us because we can't just do it through the uh, legislative process. Uh, the other thing that we have to do, my humble opinion, is we have to respect those that we are never going to convince that this is a good idea. We have to respect those that are emotionally invested for whatever personal reason uh, they just can never get to the point of saying this is a good idea. We have to respect them. We have to, uh, I believe, stop, if, if people have done it in the past, stop trying to uh, uh, badger them into agreeing that it's time. They're not going to. 
We need to respect their personal experience. We need to expect the, respect their emotional attachment uh, to the uh, embargo. And then we just have to do what we're supposed to do, which is uh, move this thing forward. Well, a lot of people say that if it made it to the House of the Floor, the votes probably exist to lift the embargo. The challenge is getting it to the floor of Congress. Would you agree with that statement? And how would you go about that? Uh, the challenge is getting it to the floor. Uh, I would suggest to people in this room, I, the, uh, the Democrat conference has, uh, I, I think, been more supportive from day one uh, on this issue. It's been the Republican side of the aisle. Uh, we introduced this bill with, uh, I think, more, more co-sponsors, even though I'm going to give you a small number. There's 10 of us, uh, the two authors, and there are eight uh, co-sponsors at this point. Uh, the nine of us are Republicans. Uh, there's some precedent, and this is why I say uh, this is not, it is a long shot to get this done in the next 14 months, but it is possible. Why? Because we've just had two bills, uh, one of which was the budget deal that was done, and the other one, David, uh, the other one was XM, that's right. Uh, so we've had two recent experiences where uh, bills that were not necessarily favored by certain members in the Republican Conference uh, leadership group actually made it to the floor and uh, they passed with somewhere around 70 Republican votes. Uh, so what does that tell you? It tells you that if you're going to be consistent, if, uh, if you can get this to the floor, you need to build your support somewhere around that 65 to 85 number. Once you have that on the Republican side, then the precedent is uh, there's a way to get this to the floor and there's a way to get it passed. I think one of the things that's very interesting about what's happening in Cuba right now is with the anticipation that uh, the embargo will be lifted and that American firms will be going to Cuba, everybody else in the world is rushing to Cuba. So um, I was just in Singapore, and Singaporean companies are looking to open luxury hotels, and the Canadians are rushing, the Spanish are there. I saw today that the Italian prime minister was there. So um, I think to a certain degree, you know, they're getting excited because they want to make sure they get their, their, their you know, business contacts made before before we're there, so I wonder if you'd like to comment on that, I mean. Well, I think that's, I, I mean, I'm a Republican. Competition is a great thing, <laughs> right? I, uh, I, I think it's, it's wonderful that, uh, first, we're starting to move in this direction. It's, it's long overdue. Uh, the administration has done everything they can do to this point uh, and sent the strong signal. I think now those of us that are in the legislative process need to follow that up to get this done. In the meantime, you know, you already have, uh, according to some polls, as much as 76% of Americans are in favor of lifting the embargo. Uh, and every day I run into more uh, um, Americans, uh, proud American citizens of Cuban descent or uh, who have uh, dual citizenship who are telling me it is time. It's time. Don't, you know, you're going to run into some of my, uh, some of my colleagues, my friends, my uh, people with uh, the same background who are going to tell you uh, you're absolutely wrong and they're going to be very uh, aggressive with you, but just please stay moving forward and get it done. I think the fact that others see this happening is, is two things. One, it is about trying to get into the marketplace and try to, you know, good for the Cuban people. This is going to create all kinds of new opportunities. And Yes, it can be used, I think, as uh, more of an urgency for one, uh, legislators, members of Congress, but also for the business community. You know, if, if the business community really, again, thinks that we can just join these groups and we can just uh, voice approval, and that once it happens, because it's inevitable, you know, when's it going to happen? Well, if it's inevitable, that doesn't mean it's going to happen in the next 14 months. Inevitable could mean within the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, it's the American businesses, again, that need to engage today in a much bigger way to let their representatives know this is something that requires major urgency because we want to make sure that we have the ability to compete with the others that are already in the marketplace. And the longer we wait, the more difficult that'll be. And if I had to ask you, what is the single biggest gating issue um, to getting this to the floor of Congress, you would say? <laughs> Congress, no. 
No, I would just say stagnation. I think, again, a, a lot of people with good intentions say this is what we want to do, and then they're not willing to do the work. It's really hard work. When there are people involved, you know, I came from a, I learned the legislative process in a body of 201. That's senators and state uh, house members. Uh, we're now in a body of 535. You know, the 201 represented 5.3 million people. The 535 represent over 300 million people that come from all different backgrounds and all different perspectives. Just because you drop a bill, just because you start to build support, just because you uh, have great gatherings like this and you have wonderful ideas, doesn't mean it happens. You gotta be pushing and you gotta be pushing hard uh, you got to be be working. So the biggest obstacle would be uh, first believing that we're already there. It's going to happen. Uh, if not this year, it's going to happen by 2017. No, don't do that. Now is the time. Uh, it's moving, and you've got to get it while it's moving. Otherwise, if we stop, uh, you may lose the moment. Did the Pope's trip create any momentum? Uh, momentum, uh, perhaps, that we're seeing in the House of Representatives about, uh, you know, it's okay to have differences. It's good. We shouldn't hide those differences. We should, uh, we should express them. But we still have to get the work done, and we have to somehow get to, uh, get to a goal. Uh, if, if the Pope's uh, address did anything, first it was genius. I mean, who ever thought that a, uh, a Pope that... You know, depending on your political perspective, there were those that were excited. Oh, he's going to talk about climate change. He's going to tell them why they're wrong. And the other side was like, oh, gosh, I hope he doesn't talk about climate change and tell us that we're wrong. Uh, and in the same speech, within two paragraphs, one, he talks about jobs. I never expected the pope to talk about jobs. And in the very next paragraph, or in the same one, if you go back and read the text, he talks about how we all should want to leave this place better than we found it, right? A great lesson to be taken from this is we got to find our points of agreement instead of uh, talking about where we disagree, right? So have the discussion, figure out where you disagree, get that to the side, figure out what it is we all want in the end. And you know, whether you're for uh, lifting the embargo or you still oppose it, uh, which I would disagree with you, the one thing that I think all of us should be able to agree on is this is about making sure that the Cuban people have a better opportunity for a better life. If that's what you uh, agree with, then we can work together and I think we can get this done. That's great. Let me take some questions from the floor. Yes, please. Identify yourself. Hi, Congressman. Uh, Guillermo Martiles, uh, Corporate Counsel at a Renewable Energy Company. Uh, thank you so much for all your work. Uh, individuals like yourself, Senator Flake, former Commerce Secretary Gutierrez, um, have, have done all of us a great service um, on the Republican side. The Democrats have been doing this for a long time, yeah. uh, and we've been hoping for, for this to happen. Uh, so with that in mind, and, and assuming that Congress sort of gets in its own way, as you mentioned, and can't do anything prior to the upcoming presidential election, is there any sense within the party, within the Republican Party, um, as to who, uh, is going to continue sort of this momentum and hold the position that you and uh, Senator Flake have held? In terms of... Uh, the, the presidential candidates on the Republican side. He has to go to that topic. I know. We said, I knew someone would ask it, which is why I didn't. You know, the, uh, there, I, I will talk around this. I, I'm going to be a little... <laughs> Well, I'm going to be a little different than others. I'm not going to try and buffalo you into thinking, hey, he just he didn't answer the question. No, I didn't. I, and you said you weren't a diplomat. Uh, well, <laughs> but I, hopefully I'm not also a complete fool. I don't want to step. You know, in Minnesota, we've got a lot of farming, as you know. The one thing you want to make sure you do is you don't step in a big cow pie. That's not <laughs> because it, it smells and it sticks to your shoes. And that's kind of what I don't want to do is stick into that same political cow pie. But you've got, uh, you've got some of our candidates who are anti uh, lifting the embargo. And it's, it's very strong. Uh, but let's put that aside for a second. They're all pro business. They're all pro trade, right? Uh, if you're pro-business, you're pro-trade, oh yes, and by the way, they are all speaking about uh, strong national security positions. 
Well, if you're for all those things, then it would seem to me that you're going to uh, listen to the will of the people that comes through the people's house and through the people's process. Uh, I wouldn't just write it off. I mean, this political uh, season, uh, the campaign season, I, I think we need to respect people who say, this is where I am on the issue. But remember, if you get through that process, if you get elected, uh, you have to lead. And leading involves uh, being part of a much bigger uh, process. It will involve the Senate and the House. I think uh, one of the things that I, I, I should tell you about the bill that we're doing, regular order. Maybe some of you have seen a lot of this discussion about regular order. And as a new member of Congress, it's, it's just a given. Regular order means it should go through a committee process, right? Uh, because too often over the last uh, many years, it's been from the top down. Uh, the Cuba trade uh, uh, bill is, we're hoping, is going to go through regular order because it will give it a better opportunity to pass in this Congress, have an opportunity. It's gone to the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee has uh, uh, jurisdiction over cer certain aspects. It's gone to uh, uh, Ways and Means, Agriculture, and Foreign Affairs. The place where I thought I was going to have the most trouble was Foreign Affairs. I've actually gotten a good reception from people on the Foreign Affairs Committee to hearing this, all right? So if it follows through the process that it's supposed to, and it happens uh, under this administration, all right, we know where this administration stands. But if it follows through this process, and it's an open, inviting, you know, transparent process, I really don't care who's in the White House in the next administration. I think they'll have a difficult time telling uh, 300 million people, uh, I'm going to defy the will of your voices in Congress. Yes, please. I share my, I share my experience. The microphone right here. Cuba and have business in Cuba. Could you identify yourself, France. please? I'm sorry? Could you identify yourself? Ike Savage is the name. Okay. Now, the older generation Cubans, which I am very familiar with, we have a printing association in the in, in Miami and so forth. They ha had the grouch because they lost their businesses. With the digest built the plant that I supplied with a lot of materials. So time is the healer. There exists a certain disagreement, reasonable, reasonable disagreement by people like the, the, the father, the grandfather. I have a personal friend of mine. What, uh, we always argue when I go to Havana and to, to Miami, we always have the argument. And I say, time, time will heal everything. Hey, Pastor, I have a personal friend of mine. Could, could you ask the question, please? What? Could you question? No, it, 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 it's basically not a question. It's just a, a, a supporting your effort. It's coming. The winds are coming, OK? I have a personal friend of mine. In, we always argue. He said, well, well, when are you ready? When are you ready? We're going to do more business. I say, what do you want me? My, when I was 15 years old, my mother was arrested. Why? For what? So the winds are coming. It takes a little while. Congressman, but you're on the right track. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Um, all the way back. Thank you. And then we'll come to the middle. Yeah. Congressman, thank you very much. I'm the Vice President of the Spain U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And I was wondering, talking about the legislative process in the U.S., um, representing a lot of uh, companies doing business in the U.S., uh, in the last five years, there has not been a tax treaty approved by, the, uh, by this country. Uh, we have all tax treaties blocked because there is one opposition of one senator. Is there a feeling that the legislative process has to be improved in this country to avoid a situation where one senator is able to block the legislative process, the approval of treaties? Well, that's why I'm in the House of Representatives. <laughs> I actually uh, gave Senator Flake a hard time the other night at a, uh, they do a spelling bee at the National Press Club with members of Congress versus journalists. And uh, <laughs> uh, Senator Flake uh, made a reference to, we don't know how to spell speaker in Congress, right? Because we were in a little bit of chaos over who our leadership was gonna be. And I, I suggested Senator Flake, 
you might know how to spell it if you just call the bill up, right? <laughs> if you would just actually debate the bill and vote on it. Uh, their legislative process improved? No, the people in Congress need to improve. I think the message you heard from the speaker, the new speaker of the house, the 54th speaker of the house, the youngest speaker of the house in over 100 years yesterday is exactly what both chambers need to follow and recognize. What he talked about was we need to just wipe the slate clean. No more personal vendettas. We're not out to, no paybacks. This is about moving forward. The American public expects it, they deserve it, right? Uh, the same thing's gonna happen, have to happen in the Senate. We're gonna need leadership in the Senate that actually starts to move things. That one particular uh, senator you're talking about, uh, that was a political, that was a political strategy. It didn't work too well. Well, it, we should know from that experience that that political strategy is a failure. Uh, and frankly, right now, in this point in time in history, uh, the legislative process and the legislators that are there to uh, participate in it need to start to look at doing, and I, the outgoing speaker said it, if you do the right thing for the right reasons, good things will happen. Uh, I think far too often, and this is a product of, of the two-party system and both becoming way too partisan in terms of, you know, it's about winning the partisan issue instead of what do we all want, right? What do we all want? We've got to start with that. Once we figure out what we all want, now let's argue our different policies of getting there, and then let's get it through the process so we can get stuff to the president's desk. And I think what happened yesterday in the House, and you folks might think, wow, he's all, I am. I think what happened yesterday for a guy who went there to actually do something, who thought he was all done with politics a couple of years ago, that I was just gonna go back to the farm and do what I do and be with my family, and then they could call back here. I didn't come here to be a witness. I came here to be an active participant and to make a difference. And I know that in the House of Representatives, there's huge turnover. I mean, can't give you the numbers on the Democrat side, but on the Republican side in the U.S. House of Representatives, we have 247 or 48 members right now. More than 50% of us have been elected within the last five years. There's a huge change, and it's generational. It's not just people. It's a generational change. It's going from a John Boehner who's been here for 25 years to in who's uh, in his 60s to a Paul Ryan who's 45. I mean, this is a generational change that's taking place. And I hope that what's going to happen is you're going to see a new effort to restore the legislative process as it was originally intended. And that because of that, we're going to get much better results. But time will tell. Thank you. And let's, let's really hope you're right because I think that's... If, if we look at what's happening from a presidential election perspective, that's what people in the, Amer in the American people want. They, want. they want something to happen. Right. Yes, right here. The good looking guy in the fourth row? <laughs> Him? <laughs> the, other, the other guy. Um, Congressman, it's really interesting being a Republican. Could you identify yourself, please? Yeah, uh, Scott Dibbett. It's really interesting you being a Republican and, and number one, not yelling. It's great. <laughs> but well, I, I could yell. Yeah, I do. Okay. No, what, <laughs> when you were doing your due diligence, when you actually started thinking about, you know, being coming out to support Cuba, was there ever a time any one constituent of yours in Minnesota was threatened by Cuban paratroopers in the whole time of the embargo? Was there ever a time we were really threatened by Cuba that forced us to do 60 years of penance on them? I, I guess that wasn't my focus. My focus when I decided I was gonna do this was on the Cuban people that I had the good fortune to, to actually meet down in Havana. The woman that looked at us uh, at, at dinner one night uh, that was serving the table and one of the members of our group said, say, are you familiar with the embargo? Yes. Well what would it mean to you if the embargo were lifted? And tears started streaming down her face. And she talked about not only how it would improve her life because she just liked to have the freedom to travel, more freedom to move back and forth, to build friendships in the US, but it was more about her kids and their future. Just imagine what it would do for her kids and the future of her country. And it, it had more to do with that for me. And then what I did is I came back when we made the decision in my office that this is something we were gonna do and I started to go meet with 
all of the members of our delegation who have been adamantly opposed to lifting the embargo. And I sat down across from them. One of them wouldn't talk uh, with me. That uh, representative has become more friendly again recently. Uh, but we had some very personal conversations about why. Uh, and I made it very clear to them that I, I respect where they come from. I mean, uh, whether they had family members that were tortured or killed. Uh, conflict is an ugly thing. And I, a kid from Minnesota, I can't understand that emotion. I can't put myself in their shoes. But I can respect the fact that they have that emotion. And once I did that, once I, I let uh, leadership know, I let leadership know right away. And uh, it was funny because at home, people were like, well, you seem to like this John Boehner. Well, yeah, I, I kind of like him. Well, you're really close with him. No, I don't think so. Well, you really agree with him on every issue. Well, you should see how he responded when I told him I was going to uh, carry the bill to lift the embargo on Cuba. I can't repeat what he said. <laughs> okay, so no, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't, paratroopers, all that wasn't in my mind. Well, my, really guy. well, thank you, but I, it, it's something that I believe in very strongly. We'll take one last question over here, young lady. Hi, Maria Ziva with the National Pork Producers Council. Thank you so much for your leadership on We trade. love pork. <laughs> thank you. We love bacon. Um, we thank you for that. Uh, like I was saying, thank you so much for your leadership on trade and especially with Trade Promotion Authority. Um, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership closing um, a couple of weeks ago and trade being on everyone's mind, do you think that's going to help build momentum for your bill and, or do you think that might you know, reduce that momentum? Oh, wait, can I just add one more thing? What are the chances to getting TPP through as well? Well, remember, uh, first off, uh, how, how is it going to impact our bill? That's a great question. And it's, frankly, I like to pride myself on thinking from the end backward. You know, I'm trained as a, uh, a lawyer, and the way you handle a new case is you answer two questions first. First question is, when's this case going to go to trial if it ever goes to trial? 12 months, 16 months, 18 Second question you answer is, what are the questions the jury is going to have to answer to resolve this conflict, right? Once you have those, then you build your case back to the beginning. I, I like to think of all those things that could happen in the uh, interim as you get to the final uh, goal. That's one I hadn't thought of. How could TPP impact this? And to your question, Susan, one, I got to read it in detail. I don't know that I've, I've seen a complete copy. I've heard from several of my constituents, right? Uh, we had major issues uh, in the dairy industry in Minnesota that actually carried over from NAFTA. Uh, I, I've heard from some others uh, that will go unnamed that they have some concerns. I'm going to have to work through those. More importantly, uh, the TPA legislation that we passed will require the Obama administration, and perhaps they've already done it, and I missed it in the last couple of days, but they're going to have to publish the agreement. Yeah, I didn't think so, but I don't want to say it. And Oh, it's online down at, OK. It hasn't been done yet. Uh, they will have to publish the agreement in total for all of America to read, not just members of Congress, for a minimum of 60 days. Depending on how that is taken, uh, if it's a positive reaction, I think it will benefit what we're trying to do with the uh, Cuba uh, trade embargo. If it's not, it could make it more difficult. Uh, but I don't know that it stops lifting the embargo because the lifting the embargo is not a trade agreement, all right? But it certainly will draw attention because trade is two things. Trade is both economic and it's our national security interest. If you start to uh, uh, do business with other countries and build relationships, uh, you, uh, quite frankly, are less inclined to get into uh, uh, violent conflict with one another. And I think people need to start focusing on both, not just the economic returns. It's about actually helping others grow their economy while at the same time we're growing ours. And guess what? One of the consequences is with a good trade relationship, uh, you get along. With that, I think our time is over. 
Congressman Emmer, I really want to thank you because you not only provided us enormous insight on Cuba and what you think the path is, you've given us homework about really going out and talking to all of our constituents, the private sector, the people that are interested, the American people and private sector businesses that are interested in Cuba and the Cuban people. And you've also given us enormous insights to Washington and other issues um, that are the, the new Congress under Paul Ryan are really going to be focused on. So thank you so much. Let's give the Congressman a hand. Thank you.